Hi everybody, this is Mark Nugent. Come at you live with Dr. Thermos. Again, um, back it up. Again, my name is Mark Nugent, candidate for Irvine City Council. Um, um, but before I turn it over to the doc and bring him on, he's just prepping some stuff to show you guys and apologize for us being a little late broadcasting live. Just wanted to point out, yes, I'm running for city council. And I've, uh, you know, there's a lot of politicians that always say, you know, prayers and thoughts and prayers for your sick family. You know, that's great. But instead of saying thoughts and prayers, I'd just, you know, try to bring you a real doctor to maybe help you stay healthy, help you and your family. So since I can't bring a doctor to everyone's house, I brought one on live. So without further ado, we have Dr. Thermos and uh, kind of turned over to him. So Dr. Thermos, can you tell us a little about yourself, your professional education as a doctor, what schools you went to, tell us about your practice and the cool thing right there. Sure. And we're gonna do some blood stuff too later. Sure, yeah. I'm, I'm Dr. Alex Thermos. Um, I, uh, of course, went through undergrad just like any other physician would. And then I first started off going through chiropractic school and practiced as a chiropractor for a while. And then decided I wanted to go back. And then I went to osteopathic school in Oklahoma and graduated uh, with an osteopathic medical degree. And then I did a residency in family medicine at um, University of Nebraska Medical Center, teamed with Offutt Air Force Base. So I was an Air Force doc uh, for a few years. And then I practiced in uh, Nebraska, moved back to Colorado to help out with my father, who was very ill. And then uh, met my wife out in Colorado. And then we moved out here to California. Uh, about eight years ago and I'm practicing here now. I do regenerative medicine, uh, more wellness type medicine, uh, trying to stay away from the prescriptions. Um, I do a lot of stuff with uh, cancer patients to try and help the cancer patients have better outcomes, uh, nutrition, etc. cetera. Uh, I, I do a lot of platelet rich plasma, uh, things to help the, uh, the joints heal up faster. I do stem cell therapy for um, uh, everything for from joint type issues, degeneration, to uh, even patients who had stroke and Parkinson's disease, et cetera, and then get some pretty good results with that. Uh, Mark had asked about my hyperbaric chamber, which is right behind me here. When I was in the Air Force, um, I went through the School of Aerospace Medicine and uh, learned about hyperbarics, and I knew as soon as I was finished with um, uh, uh, my Air Force career that eventually I would want to uh, uh, have hyperbaric chamber in my practice when I'm in private practice and I did in Colorado and of course now that I'm out here I've done the same thing out here I use oxygen it's great for treating things I mean it, what's what's more natural than just using the oxygen in order to uh, deliver it to the tissue and, and help things to heal better so awesome. also I wanted to point out um, your background that I learned about last time I didn't know that you had been family practice, treated babies, and delivered babies. Yes. And uh, we got a lot of um, soccer moms that follow us. So. Okay. And we put out there that they can ask you medical, que you know, medical questions. Sure, you bet. And we'll be streaming for like a good hour, probably. Is that okay with you? Sure. Seven, yeah. 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 So, um, so if you guys are out there, I know there's just three people, but our our assistant is sharing it to the Irvine moms and OC moms. So, um, hopefully, have some people logging on and and joining us. So, guys, please share the broadcast. Maybe someone you know is sick that could benefit from having real time, you know, medical advice from a real doctor. Okay. So um, I got plenty of questions. Um, you had some other questions um, ready ready to go? Sure, yeah. There's, there's a, a list I think might be, no, it's, uh, Nisa's got them there. Nisa, you got the list? Obviously we're so prepared. Do <laughs> you have it right there? I was gonna. You want me to ask them? Are you gonna? Yeah. So. Uh, to read them for you? Yeah. Sure. Okay. We we okay. put together a list of the more commonly asked so. questions. Yeah. Uh, so from patients uh, along the way. So, so go ahead, Mark. We'll say, call her Sarah from Irvine. Says, does everyone need to take supplements? I, I think one of the things that people need to be thinking about it's not just a matter of taking the supplement, but you're wanting to supplement a good diet. Uh, supplements do not take the place of a poor diet along the way, and so. Uh, what we need to do is be focusing on taking a supplement to do exactly that, supplement the diet, because the best nutrition is going to come out of your food if you can get good, clean food that's organic and, and not GMO compromised, etc. And the supplements are meant to shore up and help balance uh, the nutrients that you have. And sometimes people def develop nutritional deficiencies along the way, and, and so therefore taking a supplement can help you right that balance and get things uh, set back to where they need to be because homeostasis, things all working at optimal levels is the place that they need to go and oftentimes deficiencies will prevent that. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, you, you actually had me on, I'll share my vitamin D thing. You have me on 10,000 IU of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Honestly, actually, I forgot to take it for the last week and a half because I've been so busy with the campaign. So, but how does that offset? Because I'm really suntanned now, I'm out in the sun all day, every day. And I actually feel great, but I have been forgetting to take the vitamin D for about a week, week and a half now. And I ordered some off Amazon, it's coming, but. Okay. Just, so, so vitamin D is, everybody thinks about vitamin D when it comes to bones and things like that and thinks of uh, bone density and, and bone strength, et cetera. But vitamin D plays a lot of roles, uh, for example, with your immune system along the way. Um, we know that vitamin D uh, is really important in, in patients fighting cancer. The immune system works better if you've got adequate amount of vitamin D present. Um, for patients dealing with viral illnesses, we know that if you're deficient in, in vitamin D, that your ability to fight those viral illnesses is less along the way. So supplementation is optimal to bring you back. So your, your question was about being outside in the sun and... Because I know sunshine creates vitamin D, right? Correct. It helps convert the vitamin D into the active form. That's okay. the thing that that happens most as far as the sunshine goes. So if you're deficient in the substrate, being able to pull it out of your diet, you can't convert what you don't have as substrate. And so with the American diet being the way it is, it's really difficult sometimes to get adequate amount of vitamin D, yeah. and that's why they supplement milk with vitamin D all, oftentimes. Yeah. Um, hey, Cheryl. So, I just want to say hi to someone. Hey, Cheryl. So, so the other thing is okay. vitamin D can oftentimes be really okay. hard to absorb through the gut, too. Okay. And so I try and steer people towards using a sublingual form of vitamin D, something you put underneath your tongue because we can use that same mechanism that, that we use for B12 or, for example, somebody uh, needing a medication to absorb that underneath the tongue. And, and it goes in pretty quickly because the gut can be pretty complex in being able to get it to pass the mucosal barrier. Is that over-the-counter? Sub That's over-the-counter, okay. the sublingual, yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. Um, you said something about cancer and um, fighting stuff. Um, how, what do you think of vitamin C? Have you heard of, I think we discussed that study, the mm -hmm. vitamin C and cancer, mm -hmm. the high dose vitamin C. Right, so there's there's been a lot of uh, uh, physicians over the years who've used high dose intravenous vitamin C for cancer patients. There's a famous guy by, by the name of uh, Hugh Reardon who was out of uh, uh, Kansas who had been doing it for many years and uh, he is unfortunately deceased here now, but, but the uh, non-traditional medicine community has picked that up and been using that for quite a long time. And right now down at the University of Kansas, uh, they uh, have an NIH uh, protocol set up where they're treating cancer patients with intravenous vitamin C. And so the question always was, if you took intravenous vitamin C or took high dose vitamins, do they inactivate the chemotherapy uh, that patients are, are going through? Mm -hmm. And so the, the studies come out, the University of Kansas have shown unequivocally that that the intravenous vitamin C can help patients who've been through all the therapies and are not responding to anything. Okay. The intravenous vitamin C only enhances the effect of the chemotherapy. The intravenous vitamin C provides a protective effect uh, as far as dealing with the radiation therapy. The intravenous vitamin C will help the patient heal faster when coming back from the surgery because it, the body needs vitamin C in order to knit the proteins together so that the person can heal. So the intravenous vitamin C has been shown and you cannot get achieved uh, high enough levels doing it orally um, because we're talking in, in north of 30 grams per dose. Mm -hmm. And 30 grams would be the equivalent of 60 of those 500 milligram chewables all at one shot intravenously. So that's mm -hmm. a, it's quite a large dose. And as high as 100 grams intravenously at a shot. And that really stimulates uh, the body's immune system. It has a, uh, an oxidative effect. So an oxidative effect meaning uh, kind of working almost like a chemotherapy because the oxidation process helps kill some of the cells, but the, uh, it has an antioxidant effect which uh, stimulating the immune system, specifically the natural killer cell population, and those are the guys okay. that your body uses to fight cancer. Okay, awesome. I know Cheryl's watching us, so I just to say hi to her. I see you got up right here in the corner, or screen, I see right there. Ah, anyway, okay. she's actually a, a vegan, so I just wanted to get your opinion on how the vegan diet affects, and you know, you were talking about protein, kind of mm -hmm. what kind of protein is good for a vegan diet. I think she'd appreciate, since she's the only one watching right now. Sure. So, uh, so vegan diets aren't for everyone, mm -hmm. but there are a, a significant number of the population that are on vegan diets for a lot of health issue type reasons. Mm -hmm. And the big issue is is always getting in adequate amount of protein. And so the oh. thing is, you have to, as I'm sure you know, Cheryl, you got to rotate your proteins and and use a variety different protein sources in order to complete all the uh, amino acids. Um, 
The other thing is that the, the vegan diet uh, can be deficient in, and you have to be really careful of, is, uh, and most vegans understand this, is the B12 issue, is oftentimes they are deficient in B12 because most of our B12 sources come from animal protein um, and, and meats and things. And so when somebody is on a strictly vegan diet, oftentimes their B12 levels will suffer. And so by supplementing with the B12, then they avoid any deficiency issues along the way. Awesome. Awesome. Hope that uh, answers your question, Cheryl. I know you're already thinking. You're already, she was already thinking it. Uh, she's a big supporter of ours, and uh, she has our sign in the yard, in her yard. Good for you, Cheryl. We got to get this guy in office. Okay, cool. So we have um, we have John from Woodbridge. His son is in the football team, and he asks, um, "How much water per day should I drink?" And also, my son, that's an athlete on the football team, how much should he drink? So, so the issue today is we are pretty much a dehydrated society and people don't drink enough water uh, along the way. So for the average person who's uh, living in a home and going back and forth to work every day, um, there's a, a vital amount which is needed to replace what you, you lose from filtration, excreted from the kidneys, as well as what evaporates from the respiratory tract, et cetera, and from our skin. And so a good measuring stick is to take the person's weight. So let's say a person is 180 pounds, and we take their weight and divide it in half, being 90 pounds, and so therefore a goal of getting to 90 ounces per day of water. Now 90 ounces per day of water sounds like a lot, especially if somebody's only consuming 12 to 24, ounce, or 24 ounces a day of water because of the society we live in with all the, the sodas and things like that that everybody drinks. So uh, we are very much a dried out society. The water is really necessary in order to wash things through our bodies and, and cleanse the body. Most of the reactions that take place require water to be present as well. And if you're in a dehydrated state, you can alter the physiology and the body just isn't going to work as well. So getting an adequate amount of water in the body is really important. You gotta get a clean water source, needless to say. I'm a big advocate for like a filtered, uh, filtered type water um, uh, because if you're not getting the clean water and you're dumping in dirty water along the way, you're gonna dirty the inside of your body as well. Okay, so um, Tracy from Sacramento wrote in, and she said, is taking ibuprofen, ibuprofen every day harmful? Yeah, ibuprofen every day, that can be a real bugaboo along the way. Everybody thinks of stomach issues and, and the ulcer and uh, developing an ulcer and that sitting on your stomach, but you got to come back to, well, what about, what are you taking the ibuprofen for? There's an inflammatory process that's either been correctly identified or not identified, and if you're taking the ibuprofen just to suppress that signal, sometimes pain is a warning signal, something that you need to be taking care of. Now, I understand people need to be comfortable, and I would be lying to you if I said I never take an ibuprofen ever myself, but I really try to limit that to a minimum amount. But one of the things you want to be thinking about, too, is it doesn't just affect just the inflammation right at the site. That ibuprofen, when you take it orally, goes and flows through the rest of the tissues of your body as well it can affect the liver and affect liver function. We've known it to compromise liver function. We know it can compromise kidney function along the way. We know it can also affect coagulation ability. Um, there are some real bugaboos to taking ibuprofen on a daily basis, and if somebody has to take ibuprofen regularly, they really need to get to the bottom of what they're taking the ibuprofen for and figure out another strategy so that they don't wind up damaging something that, that uh, just trying to treat a symptom that they have. Awesome, okay. Did you share the, the video? Okay. Okay, so Patrick from Irvine wrote in, I am constipated every day or I have diarrhea. What should I do? That's, that's not as uncommon as you think. Uh, I, I see a fair number of patients that come through having alternating constipation or diarrhea, and that can be a symptom of something known as IBS. Now, IBS is a big wastebasket term. Uh, because a lot of physicians haven't done much to try and diagnose it other than just try and control the symptoms along the way. If you're constipated on a regular basis, one of the things you want to be thinking about is that when you're constipated is that material stays in your large intestine and it, and it putrefies. And with that putrefication process, there's a release of a lot of poisons and such like that. You get absorbed into your circulation and affect a lot of other tissues. Conversely, if somebody's got diarrhea and things are shooting through with a regular basis, they're not only losing water, but they're also losing all the nutrients. So what they're taking in as far as food goes, they don't have the opportunity to absorb. So that can create a nutritional deficiency. And if somebody's alternating back and forth between diarrhea and constipation, there can be some real problems happen as a result. What I think 
patients need to do, especially if it happens with any kind of regularity, you need to have a, a physician look at you, try and see if they can't figure out what's going on. Sometimes patients, if they just get on a regular program, taking a probiotic, which you can get over the counter, sometimes that can help rectify things and, and turn things around. There are some situations where the, the patient really needs to have a stool test, where they do a culture of the stool and look at all the different bugs that are in the stool and find out, well, what, what are some of the causative agents? What are the things that are causing them to have the diarrhea? Sometimes they could have an infectious type process, be it a bacteria, a virus, uh, a yeast, a parasite, a variety of different things, and getting to the bottom of that, instead of just treating the symptom, trying to stop the diarrhea, stop the diarrhea or trying to start the bowel moving in a constipation process. Okay, cool. So Michael from Irvine, uh, he asked, uh, what are the stem cells? What can they be used to help with? You do stem cell therapy, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so stem cell therapy, um, the body uses stem cells in order to do healing process just naturally on its own. What we've done uh, through research now is, is being able to take those stem cells and apply them to areas so that we can encourage thing, tissues to heal. Okay. A really famous one that's being done all the time now is using stem cells for joint type problems. People having advanced arthritis, uh, advanced cartilage degeneration, ligaments that are all stretched out and partially torn, menisci, the little cartilage that sits in between the, uh, the two big bones as far as the knee is concerned, those menisci being torn up and needing to heal and they can bend and twist and, and lock the knee and create quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of discomfort. What the stem cells are doing is we're trying to plant those stem cells in the area where we know that there's an inflammatory process, where we know there's some degeneration taking place. And the stem cells have the great advantage that they, they can uh, uh, figure out exactly what needs to be done in the area. So the stem cell can go in and it can differentiate into a variety of different things. Some stem cells, when placed in the knee, will turn into bone. Some stem cells, when placed in the knee, will turn into the cartilage surface. Some stem cells when placed in the knee can also go to shore up and become ligament. So the stem cells, the, in, the innate ability to become whatever the tissue is, that the body needs to fix things. The other thing is that they do is they, they also call out to all the other tissues and they can stimulate the localized stem cell production mm -hmm. and direct some of the tissues. Think about a foreman working on a construction site. And the foreman comes in and they can do some work themselves, but they direct a lot of the other tissues around there in order to uh, regenerate tissue and, and stimulate the whole healing process. And we've used stem cells for stroke, we use stem cells for Parkinson's disease, we've used them for all kinds of ligaments and, and, really? and joint injuries. Yeah. Yeah, there's um, somebody I'm thinking about, I don't want to mention her names, but uh, she may, I should have tagged her. Um, she had a stroke. Mm. So, so, to, so, so the problem with a, a stroke is there are two types of strokes. There's the uh, embolic stroke, in other words, a, a clot g busts off and, and mm -hmm. clogs up a vessel. And then there's the hemorrhagic stroke, mm -hmm. where the blood vessel breaks open, usually as a result of a uh, elevated blood pressure on the way. And then there's a rupture and bleeding. They both have the final common endpoint of interrupting circulation, mm -hmm. circulation getting the to the uh, brain itself in a focal area and that mm -hmm. when you compromise brain tissue and restrict the blood flow you can't feed it mm -hmm. with nutrition you can't get oxygen to it along the way and so a lot of tissues die so in stem cell therapy we're not looking to resurrect dead tissue and that's a common misconception is that the parts that are dead when somebody's had a had a stroke those places are dead but we know that the brain has some regenerative capacity right now and so that's why we're using the stem cells and so the stem cells when planted if they go into the area uh, they can encourage the tissue to turn around and start generating new cells and then if we can encourage those connections supply a better oxygen supply um, and blood flow and that's one of the reasons we use a hyperbaric chamber in those patients as well mm -hmm. we can stimulate the generation of new blood vessels where the body actually regenerates and creates new blood vessels to the tissue which was compromised and by getting blood flow to the tissue that was compromised the area that's not working so well it's referred to as the penumbra getting that penumbra to finally start functioning again we're taking tissues that are still alive but just marginally functioning and providing them oxygen providing them nutrients basically giving the ability to turn on and if we can turn them on and we have that ability to do that, then that's going to help with some restoration of function. And you can never predict what somebody's going to get as far as a, a response goes. But there are a lot of factors that you can control and, and, and maximize your chances for a good clinical outcome. Does age factor 
age definitely can factor into um, recovery from stroke. And so that's, that's why now we've got some other options as far as like for stem cells. So in a younger person, I would try to use their own stem cells. Specifically, I would pull stem cells out of the, uh, the bone marrow of the, the top of the hip. And if we pull those stem cells out and we can concentrate those and then introduce those uh, two different ways intravenously. And then we've got a special way of doing it intranasally so that the stem cells can go right to the brain. And so the, the stem cells migrate to the area based on inflammation. So inflammation is helpful in that case. And it acts like a homing signal so the cells know where to go. So it's like looking for a beacon of light and they go towards the light. And so the stem cells then migrate to the area where they need to go set up housekeeping and if we can keep them nourished then they have a chance and then they have a chance to recover with older folks we can't use their stem cells off at times so let's say we get a person who's 85 years old and they've had a stroke well that means their stem cells that they have if we pull out of the the bone marrow of the hip would also be 85 years old well those are pretty old and they're a lot not likely to be as as functional and so there are ways of using uh, now we use umbilical cord stem cells so in other words Stem cells harvested from live, ba uh, live birth babies. So no babies were ever harmed in this and we can take those stem cells and introduce those intravenously as well as intranasally. And you can get a, a positive change take place if you've restored some of the circulation, open the highway so the stem cells have the, uh, the opportunity to be able to get to the area, nourish them properly, and then we can get some function back. So- My sister took her, her son's umbilical cord and put it in a bunny. Correct. Yeah, so that's that's a process that's relatively new in the last 15 years. I mean, it hasn't been being done forever, and 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 the way things are set up with the government right now, it really kind of ties your hands. So uh, to be able to use it, except for the person who the 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 cord cells were saved from 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 your son's birth. And so, uh, if we ever needed to use those for your son's birth, uh, uh, for your son along the way, those would be accessible. However. In a lot of cases, nobody's had any stem cells that have been saved up. Nobody, nobody's uh, saved any umbilical cords along the way. And so therefore, there are donated cords. So when somebody comes in and gives birth to the baby and everything's healthy and the tissue is tested to the umpteenth degree to make sure there are no infections or anything like that, we can take those stem cells. And actually, we don't take them. The uh, tissue banks are the ones who take them and they're the ones who process them. And we can purchase cells um, uh, and use those for the patient who's uh, who's ill or who's, who's had the injury. Now, and usually it has to be compatible. Well, that's the great part about the umbilical cord cells is because they are so so young, they are considered immunologically privileged, meaning that they don't have as many of the antigens present on the cell surface, so the body's not going to react to them. Uh, wow. So we can use umbilical cord cells from somebody who's not even related to you and treat you and you're not going to react to them. And that's, and that's the great thing about the uh, uh, umbilical cord cells is because they are, they are new. Now if we took, let's say somebody's bone marrow and tried to give that to you, unless you matched exactly, you would reject it and there would be a big problem with something like that. So with umbilical cord cells, we've got a, we've got a new vehicle in order to treat some of these things, which we might not have had the opportunity for otherwise. Awesome. I'm trying to tag more people. Cheryl was saying, yeah. how do you feel about intermittent fasting? Intermittent fasting is a great thing. It's great for cleansing the body, for one. We also know that a, a person's own stem cell production increases. So in other words, we all have stem cells within us along the way, and we know we can increase our own production of stem cells to release for healing doing intermittent fasting. The other thing that intermittent fasting does is it helps reset our ability to regulate sugar metabolism, which is really great. And so um, that's one of the ways of treating someone and helping bring down their fasting insulin levels using the intermittent fasting and sticking them on a very specific diet, which is low in carbohydrates. You can actually retrain the body to produce less insulin and to increase the number of receptors on the cells and improve their their sugar tolerance, uh, so to speak. The other thing is that intermittent fasting does is we know this, it really works well with cancer patients along the way. When a, when a cancer patient is going in for therapy, we know that doing some intermittent fasting immediately before the, the therapy not only boosts the immune system function, but it also enhances 
uh, any treatment process that's done against the cancer in itself. Here's the thing, as we know, the cancer cells are, are uh, dominantly, not 100%, but in the 98.9% of the, the cancer cells uh, really love sugars along the way. And so when you do some intermittent fasting, you're basically starving those cancer cells. And so you're weakening them along the way. And when you weaken those cancer cells, they're more vulnerable to any therapy that you employ, be it radiation therapy, be it chemotherapy, be it intravenous vitamin C therapy. You're, you're making the, the cancer cell more, more vulnerable by doing the intermittent fasting and combining with the treatment. And so uh, intermittent fasting has got a lot of great benefits. We're just on the, on the verge of discovering all kinds of things about, uh, about the body, all the things we used to think we can throw away here right now because there's all kinds of new, uh, new things that have developed uh, through research at this point in time that we're taking advantage of, which can make a huge difference in somebody's health. How do you keep up with all this? My wife will tell you I'm up all the time, all through the night. I'm always reading, always, I'm always going to conferences and, and such like that. I just I feel really blessed because I've I've got a healthy curiosity really? ever since I was sorry, a little kid. Sorry, Bill Cook. So, if you guys got so. any questions, by the way, feel free to ask. And the doctor is in right here. Um, free medical advice. How awesome is that? The doctor thermos is volunteering his time. So, uh, we're just covering stem cell therapy. Um, there was a lot of interest in that one. Um, so, what is PRP? and what can it be used for? Uh, PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. Okay. And so uh, what, what that is, platelets are uh, little devices that God placed in our vessels which are used for helping clot things off. They help with the clotting process so when you get a cut um, uh, that you can seal that off more quickly. At least that's what we used to think that they were all, all that they were good for. We now know that all these platelets are like little Ziploc bags full of growth factors. And so when somebody has an injury, if you take platelets and you concentrate them and you take those growth factors and you place them at the injury site, you can enhance the healing process along the way. Those growth factors stimulate all the local stem cells that are there in order to proliferate and start trying to heal the tissue along the way. PRP has been used in a lot of professional athletes. It's been used across the globe and is really safe because you're using the patient's own plasma. Yeah. And literally we just take the patient patient's plasma, yeah. we spin it down, separate it, pull off the platelets, and inject that into the area. Initially that was developed, um, honestly, uh, with uh, the advent of heart surgery. So the big issue was, was trying to get the sternum in order to heal up, and so they developed PRP as a uh, uh, adhesive, and they would paint it across the breastbone after they had break somebody's uh, chest open in order to encourage healing as far as the bone goes, and they found it wildly successful at things things that heal and that's where platelet-rich plasma first got its uh, first got its start and now it's being used for all types of uh, bone joint and ligament injuries and, and is really helpful to, for the healing process especially things that are stubborn and not healing very well and yeah okay so that the, that's the that's the part of PRP that I don't I don't get involved in but there but there are a lot of uh, people uh, involved in the cosmetic industry and they're using things um, they're taking uh, PRP and they're they're injecting it into the uh, the skin subdermally and stimulating the local stem cells of the face which then gives quite a uh, quite a, a healing response and a lot of ladies are really thankful for the results of their skin we have a question from Cheryl um, Cheryl asks can donating blood every eight weeks cause scar tissue to your veins to that's your vein okay well, that's there's very much an individual type thing and and needless to say you wouldn't want to be used be poking anything at the same place over and over and over again every eight weeks because if you did the body's natural response is to scar things off and yes i would be concerned about go accessing the same site now the thing is with pulling blood off when somebody's donating blood there are a variety of different places you can pull the blood from mm -hmm. So it does not have to be something, a prohibitive type thing along the way. There are patients who have a tendency to scar more than others. We, you mm -hmm. can see those all the time. They're, they make keloid type scars on the skin. Mm -hmm. And the problem is when they're making keloid type scars with the skin, they tend to make those same type of scars internally as well. Okay. And so someone that has that keloid formation, that would be somebody that I would be really hesitant 
to have them donating blood on a regular basis because they're going to be creating scars. And those scars can be pretty chunky things, which can actually obstruct vessels themselves. <coughs> so that would be, that, that's very much an individual type thing from person to person. And I think that's, you'd have to choose that based upon your own, your own physiology. Awesome. Well, there's one thing I really want to ask, and it's this thing looking like a submarine right behind us. And that's the next question. What is hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and what is it used for? And uh, maybe at that, right after you finish that, we can take a look at that. I'll flip the camera up and. Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah. So the hyperbaric chamber, uh, most people are familiar with it being used in the diving industry, and so to help somebody uh, who's, let's say. Um, uh, arisen from the depths too quickly and, and everybody's heard of the bends where you basically precipitate out nitrogen bubbles of gas in the in the bloodstream and so that in itself can be fatal and so we had to have a way of reintroducing repushing those nitrogen bubbles back into uh, into uh, suspension in the serum mm -hmm. and so by putting them back at depth is a way to do that and just bringing them up more slowly so can you do that in this thing th this chamber isn't uh, rated to, you really need something rated to at least six atmospheres in order to be able to do, uh, mm -hmm. do something like that, which is a, okay. a real deep dive uh, as far as a, a person goes actually out in the ocean. Okay. Now this, this chamber here is, will go up to uh, right at two plus atmospheres, which for most of the things that I treat in an office type situation work pretty well. Can, um, as we're explaining it, can we, can we do a quick walk? Sure, yeah. Let me uh, flip the camera so we guys to show you. And I'll hold the camera and uh, hold the mic so Dr. Thermos can show us. <coughs> so the hyperbaric chamber, the one that I have is a solid metal. This, this baby weighs uh, right in at 2,100 pounds. There are some people out there that have some of these soft-sided chambers, um, which you just can't generate enough pressure for in order to, gen uh, to uh, be able to help force the oxygen into the tissues as much. So th this chamber will go to two atmospheres, and, and when we do that, with the, uh, the oxygen that we're running in, then we can really saturate the tissue with up to 20 times the amount that you'd be able to carry just breathing the oxygen just by itself. So what do you most, your most patients use this one for? Um, so I, I use this, and I've used hyperbaric oxygen for quite a few years for stroke rehab, for like we had talked about before, when somebody's got a compromised uh, circulation as far as the brain goes, we can stimulate the body to, to make more blood vessels. Uh, it's called angiogenesis, generating more blood vessels right at the tissue using the pressurized oxygen. It'll stimulate the blood vessels to proliferate, and if we can grow many more buds, we can supply the tissue with more, o more oxygen. The brain does not function without oxygen along the way, and so the more oxygen we can provide it, especially areas that are compromised, the better chance we have at something being able to bounce back. Awesome. So I do this with stroke patients, any neurologic type injury, um, concussion type stuff along the way, it, it can be really helpful for any, healing for wounds, diabetic wounds. Any, he, any sports medicine? Concussion type yeah. stuff, chronic sprains and strains, oftentimes there's a lot of scar tissue built up as a result of the chronic sprain strain, and so getting some blood flow, stimulating some new blood flow to the okay. tissue can help it to heal so as well. So performance enhancement also? Absolutely correct. But didn't Neil Armstrong use the hyperbaric chamber also? That, that was. That, that I'd have to defer because I, I, I don't know about him directly. Well, I just um, saw a documentary on professional cyclists that would sleep in hyperbaric chambers. Well, Lance Armstrong. Yeah, Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. I, I was thinking Lance Arm, uh, Neil Armstrong, the guy who landed on the moon. I didn't. But I, I mean, that was. But a lot of cyclists would they talk about that? They would use these things. It, absolutely. In fact, quite a few professional athletes even have them installed into their homes just to assist with recovery because it's mm -hmm. been found to be really beneficial for. Uh, quicker recovery from injury as well as just from exhaustion when you've stretched your tissues to the limits. So how long do you put a patient in here for? Like half an hour at a time? Or? So a patient's in the chamber and they've got a, a mask on where they're breathing, uh, breathing the oxygen uh, for 90 minutes. I do 90 minute treatments. The range is usually between 60 to 90 minutes a long way. I'm just going to back to you guys just wanted to kind of... Um, and so the patients are in the chamber for 60 to 90 minutes at a time. Um, I tend to like to do 90 minute treatments just because it seems like we hit a sweet spot right at 60 minutes. And actually, if we do two 90 minute treatments, uh, which would be three hours total in the, in the chamber, we actually get the healing capability of a four to five hours total as far as chamber time. So we're actually getting enhanced healing abilities take place when we when we do it for that just a little bit longer. Yeah. 
I twisted my knee the other day. I'm still walking, so maybe I can come check to do this thing. After I'd the be election. I'd be I'd be glad to pop in here, Mark, and I think yeah. there's some things we could do to make that knee heal up heal up quicker, yeah. just as it is today. Yeah, um, I did twist my ankle in a yesterday too, but since I'm lighter, it's not as bad. <laughs> awesome. All that walking on the campaign trail is keeping you busy. Yeah, it's uh, I feel really good too. Like I feel happy. Like walking 10, 15, about 20 miles a day, just feel really good. And I'm sure all the people that you're out meeting there really appreciate you coming by and yeah. being able to talk to you and ask you questions when oh, yeah. you're out on the trail. Oh, definitely. And um, yeah, the first three, four days was kind of tough after that. It's just my body got adjusted and uh, that's it. So awesome. We got more questions and then we're going to do the blood thing, right? Sure. Yeah. Can we say what the experience is when you come to Dr. Service's office? What? Wait, what? Uh? It's like you come in and then you Oh yeah, let's hear it. Okay. Oh, awesome. <laughs> okay. We'll do a tour of the office. So. Um, so here's the office. Here's the Dr. Thermos's office. You guys come in here. Obviously, um, if you're from Irvine, you're like, oh, you support Mark. Obviously, they support me. And uh, this is all the stuff he does. Um, on top of delivering babies, not anymore. He used to deliver babies, all that stuff. So and then we're over here. But you, when you come in, you're yeah. greeted by his beautiful yeah. wife, Sandra. Yeah. Yeah. And then you are greeted by the best. There you go. Our therapy dogs, yeah. Therapy, therapy dogs. Support dogs. I, I've had these two. Uh, they're they're going on ten years old, and and when I was back in Colorado, I noticed that they would uh, go up and sit by the person who was the sickest in the office when we had multiple patients in the office. And so if somebody was getting intravenous oh, okay. vi uh, vitamins or, or medications or whatever, I knew that if the dogs went and sat by them and stayed by them for any length of time, I knew that I had to pay extra attention to that person that there was something I might not know about because they were more ill than necessarily they appeared and that was proven out over and over again so now with our office here uh, in Laguna Hills these guys are, are, are kind of my sentinels for me they they can tell me a lot about somebody along the way and uh, help me understand if I need to be more concerned about any type of situation somebody coming through the door I can tell you a cancer patient that uh, we had come through here and the lady was really sick and unfortunately she wound up having some fluid get out into her lung. She, uh, the, it had escaped uh, from her lung and, and was putting some pressure on her lung itself. And my girls here would just not leave her alone. They sat by her side no matter where she went here. And to me that said, okay, so what's going on with this lady mm -hmm. along the way? And sure enough, uh, when I listened, and I didn't know it was her lungs, but after I examined her and we talked a little more, Sure enough, I, after I examined her, she had some fluid in her lungs. I wound up sending her for a chest x-ray, and absolutely, she had something developed that she hadn't had before. And so I credit them with uh, helping me figure out that I need to know a little bit more about what was going on with, uh, with her, which I think made a big difference as far as in, in her care. Okay. So you get the dogs. You come to Dr. Miss' office, you get to see the dogs, too. They're really friendly. Awesome. So... So where are we at? And also we're gonna look at my blood here under the microscope and you guys get to see what a red blood cell and white blood cell look like. I thought it was awesome. For them it's just another day at the office. First time I ever did that here, I saw my own blood and he showed me what everything was. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And um, we'll do that in a minute and uh, we'll take the blood, put it in the microscope and put it on the big TV so you guys can see. But I did eat today so yeah, you usually do it in your fasting. It can make things look stickier. So so the reason we do that and looking at the blood is sometimes the blood can give us hints as far as to what's going on. It's, a, it's kind of a real-time picture as far as to what's going on inside the body uh, right at that time. And so sometimes we don't have the benefit of having recent lab work being done and somebody come in being sick and looking at their blood underneath the microscope can really kind of give me some insight as far as to what's going on. Now, Mark, talk about a, a situation where he'd just eaten. So... Um, and so we know that if somebody's running a super high cholesterol or super high blood sugar, um, it will cause things to be stickier, it's where the blood, the blood cells will stick together. And you can see that it's plain as day when we look at things underneath the microscope there, which is why I have patients come in fasting so that we can know that the condition of their stickiness, is it because of an inflammatory process or is it because of uh, cholesterol numbers or sugar or, or whatever okay. that we need to investigate. So. Uh, we'll we'll see what Mark's looks like after this today. Well, can we go straight into that, guys? Because people are like, kind of maybe we got a bunch of people watching too. Maybe they just want to go into that. Is that okay? And then we come back and finish up with some questions. Sure. Yeah. Let's <coughs> let's let's take a. So Nisa, did you want to operate the the camera? 
just uh, I'll flip it around and then you can aim it at us and then um, hold the microphone as well. It makes it look thin. <laughs> so let's get, a lot of weight. let's get a blood sample here from Mark. Okay. I'll do this. Okay. okay. Squeeze his finger. I'll take a sample. And I'll put it underneath the microscope. All right, guys. Then we can, looks like it's going to be up here on the big screen. So let's. Uh, Any questions? Here. No? Let me show them the microscope. You can walk around here and you can kind of see it. He puts it on there and then he puts it up on the big TV and we're going to see my blood. This is pretty cool. It is? Yeah, it is. Okay, I got it. I got it. Hold it. So, so we're going to look at my blood up there. And he has all of his blood samples. This is like, for us laymen, this is like the coolest thing in the world. So there's all the. You're going to be nervous. Of, there's, okay, there it is right there. Okay. Okay. So, so I did eat though, so it's a little. Yeah, so like we were talking about, when somebody having something to eat, it'll cause things to be stickier, just like we're seeing these cells all sticking together uh -huh. like this, and they aggregate. And the, the problem is, is that when, if somebody is having a lot of the stickiness, sometimes some of the blood vessels, the capillaries, the tiniest ones, are only wide enough that one cell can get through in order to get in. And so if you've got a big clump of cells like this, Needless to say, there's going to be some compromised circulation along the way, and you're not going to be delivering the oxygen to the tissues like you, like you need to. Yeah. So, so this can give us a, a good insight as far as to what's taking place there. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of clumping there in, in Mark's case. I'm not worried about that right now just because Mark had just eaten, so which would be one thing that we I would have him avoid at the time when we're... The last time it came in was in the afternoon, but I didn't eat for a good four or five hours before we did this. I looked at the blood. There you go. You know, we talk about political transparency in candidates. So you're literally <laughs> looking at my blood, so I'm pretty transparent. So it there's my... About as transparent as you can get. <laughs> there's, there's my blood, uh, Irvine. There you go. So my here... doctor's saying it's healthy blood, but for me. <laughs> so here's a white blood cell. You can see he's moving this direction here like so. And if you look at all these little granules within it, there's some movement and such taking place, and he's moving this direction because he's going after something up here along the way, which is important that we get, we see when we look at the white blood cells we, that we see movement underneath there because, I, for example, see cancer patients who've been through a lot of chemotherapy, and actually the uh, cellular mechanism has been poisoned, and so they wind up just sitting still and they don't have any movement, and there's nothing worse than, Im than an immobile immune system. I mean, if it's immobile, then its ability to defend you from a variety of different things are, are really compromised along the way. So, um, so we use this as a, as a tool to kind of gain some insight. It is not uh, uh, co comprehensively diagnostic by any stretch. We don't use it for that, pers for that perspective. We use it more as another another tool in order to figure out, well, what, what's happening with this patient? Doctors in the olden days used to draw blood samples from patients all the time and look at them underneath the microscope. And that's just something that's a, a lost art. I know when I was out in rural Nebraska, because that was part of my training program, is that the doctors had microscopes out there. But in, right in the city, most doctors won't even have a microscope in their office. And, and that, I think, really can be really helpful at, at putting all the clues together. If you can figure some things out, sometimes you can see some things that uh, that are going on as far as the blood goes that you wouldn't know just from the numbers that are just on a page. Um, for example, like the cells, if they're nice and round, like these are really overlapping, but if you can see like the, the membrane here where they're nice and round, if this membrane is really lumpy, something called poikilocytosis, if it's really lumpy, I can say that they're probably having some problems absorbing nutrients specifically the antioxidants. And so that would be an insight into, gee, if they've got a combination of diarrhea and they've got lumpy looking cells, it would tell me that, gee, they're not, they're shooting things through fast enough that they're never able to absorb the nutrients. And so it's compromising the quality of the cells that their body's making along the way, which could be a really big deal. And just numbers on a page sent through a laboratory oftentimes won't tell you that along the way. 
So I, I really find this a valuable tool and I, I really like to use it with my patients. Awesome. And there you got a chart of some other stuff going on too, some other examples. Yeah, the thing should be, this is ideal, this right here. Mm -hmm. So where all the cells are kind of sitting side by side mm -hmm. and all they're all pretty much uniform in, in size and the, uh, the membranes are all intact. Contrast that with this poikilocytosis, which is what I was talking about, which is the cells are really lumpy. And you can see a big difference between these lumpy looking cells and the healthy looking cells along the way. And so this would be a person who is having some problems with more than likely absorption uh, of nutrients, uh, compromising their, their cell integrity. Awesome. That's what I do what, every six months? Yeah. We do every three, four to six months is usually have me come in here. Yeah, we're looking at some things for you, Mark, which are different than, than other folks. Everybody's got their own particular things we watch for along the way. Um, the ours was making sure I'm healthy before and after the election. <laughs> because uh, honestly, I'm eating a lot of McDonald's drive through Not it's, a good thing. Yeah, it's not, but you got to That'll cause the go. stuff to get really sticky. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I had. actually I had McDonald's like three times today. Because as we're going house to house and, you know, just moving on the campaign trail, there's not much time to do anything and eat healthy. Yeah. I love a salad. And just sit there and have a nice coffee and a nice long dinner. But well, here is proof. Here's a little bacteria kind of flitzing around, and everybody yeah. gets a little bacteria showing up periodically. Now here's actually uh, a yeast colony mm -hmm. right here. This little light colored circle here. But everybody has little bacteria flitzing around. But here's proof. This is what happens. This is one of the things that creates uh, problems with circulation when somebody uh, eats a lot of junk food along the way. You'll get a situation of this. Now this isn't Mark all the time he had just eaten and but this is what takes place even somebody who's fasting who's eating a lot of junk food this is the kind of stuff we see all the time mm. and actually, right before i came over i had bananas and peanut butter as i ran i dropped my son's backpack off um, i forgot that and yeah. then i had scarfed down two bananas and peanut butter and drove over here so then also mcdonald's before that though well the great thing about this too is you can see changes you can see things change so as you as somebody who's got a really bad diet as they clean up their diet this will improve mm -hmm. and 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 if you improve your cellular delivery of oxygen all tissues need oxygen along the way we know that that can only improve your health all, yeah. uh, uh, for any individual on the planet yeah how was drink, uh, drinking a lot of coffee affect this so when you drink a lot of coffee what happens is is that you concentrate you you basically pull the serum off which what that does is that causes all these guys to be closer to one another and be stickier so you can create a sludge type situation yeah. with dehydration yeah. and then the then the uh, cells just not being able to flow through and not being able to get to tissues because it's it's too right. quote thick along the way and so dehydration is a big issue. That's why when we were talking about water before is a big thing. But one of the things that causes dehydration in a lot of patients is their coffee intake. So yeah, if somebody's I, drinking I, I, six cups of coffee a day, that's quite a load of caffeine. Yeah, I'm not, I don't drink alcohol, but I drink, do drink a lot of coffee. I admit, <laughs> I, admit, I admit that. I usually stop drinking coffee by about 10 o'clock at night or I won't sleep. So, um, no McDonald's and no coffee. No, I drink coffee. Yeah, that's not going to change. I mean, I'll, I'll live in it, but then you probably need to drink a lot more water. Well, I always don't drink my McDonald's, and if I do, it's just, just the egg dishes for the protein. So, that's, so uh, did that answer your questions about the blood work? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think this is awesome. What is that black thing? We have good retention. The audience is liking it. A lot of people are sticking around to watch this stuff. So This, this black so. bugaboo right over here, that's what you're talking about? Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a spot in my lens. <laughs> <laughs> I got a dirty lens. Okay. So, that's not something wrong with Mark. Oh, okay. Okay. So That's you guys go. great. So, there you go. Transparency, healthy candidate. Okay. Full disclosure. All right. Awesome. Uh, thanks, doctor. Let's, uh, let's this is done for every patient, right? Yeah, it's done for every patient. Um, oh. Anyway, guys, um, they're gonna, we're going to come sit down. I have the best doctor ever. He's been my doctor three years, over three years now. Um, supported me last election and as well as this one and um, he's volunteering his time so I appreciate that and if you guys did want to donate you guys can go to the website I'll give it to you real quick you guys can go right there and click the donate button 
again, we are not funded by big money or PACs or developers. It's just small individual, you know, regular individuals donating. Anyway, we'll get back to uh, um, the questions. Okay. Okay, so finish up the questions. And... Cheryl, I agree with you there. I see your comments. No McDonald's. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We got uh, plenty of other questions. I'm not sure how much time you got left, but um, sure, whatever, whatever you need, Mark. Well, we, now we got like seven, eight people watching live. That's actually pretty good. It might uh, increase as we hang out. Usually, when you do the long forms, you know, it, it it ramps up. And if you guys want to ask questions, the doctor's right here. So, um, the next question comes: uh, What is fibromyalgia? chronic fatigue. Okay. So fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue are two diagnoses which are which are out there. Uh, if you go back to even when I finished residency back in the 90s, um, people were starting to acknowledge it. Unfortunately, back then it was considered a psychiatric diagnosis that uh, most physicians didn't believe the patients were having the pain or having the fatigue issues. Now we know with the advent of of better laboratory testing, we can identify some things which uh, which can cause both of them. Um, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue are oftentimes very similar type uh, issues, but they're kind of at opposite ends of the spectrum, be it uh, being a chronic fatigue being the most predominant symptom versus with fibromyalgia pain being the most chronic symptom. And, and a lot of the patients exist somewhere in between. So there's, there's oftentimes an overlap, whether it be chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or a combination of the two. Uh, one of the things that causes a lot of chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, we know that some of these stealth viruses, which we thought were eradicated after somebody got an infection, they do come back. Uh, they do hang around forever. Uh, specifically, Epstein-Barr virus is a really common one. Um, cytomegalovirus is another common one. Uh, HHV6 is another common one. Those are all viruses which have been known and shown through lots of data to be uh, contributing factors and when they're chronic uh, and, and keeping somebody sick will drain them of their energy. With fibromyalgia, one of the more common type things is it's oftentimes there are hormonal type imbalances and nutritional imbalances that go along with fibromyalgia. Uh, mag this can be as simple as a magnesium deficiency. It can be an overlapping thing with uh, significant thyroid, adrenal, and in ladies, estrogen, progesterone issues, and in men, testosterone issues. So it can be very complex. Uh, a lot of times uh, when patients have a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and you get two patients side by side and they talk about it, they've got a lot of similarities and they've got a lot of differences. And that's because that diagnosis was created, it's more of a wastebasket type diagnosis. In other words, if nobody else had an idea what to call it, it was called fibromyalgia or it was called chronic fatigue syndrome. Now that we've got the, the better laboratory type testing, we can tease things out and figure out what needs to be addressed. And by addressing the individual factors, you can make some changes. So there are no two patients with fibromyalgia which will get exactly the same treatment. There are no two patients with chronic fatigue syndrome which will get exactly the same treatment unless they're their bodies are identical, and very seldom do I ever see that happen when somebody comes through the door. Okay. Um, I'm seeing their questions. Oh, Cheryl says, um, how do you feel about HPV vaccines? And after her question, I had some other general quality of life medical questions I thought that people watching here would benefit from. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm, I'll just go on record. I don't do, do it's, not, it's not the nature of my practice to do any vaccines. I haven't done any vaccines. Uh, because I don't practice as a traditional family medicine doc, um, and I do that very specifically so that I don't have to be dealing with the vaccine type issue. I'm not a big fan of the vaccines, um, uh, specifically the uh, HPV vaccine or, or, or dealing with a lot of the hepatitis type vaccines, and, uh, except in very specific type of situations. I'm not a flu vaccine type guy. Uh, I think the, the data have, have borne itself out that so many of the people that got the flu vaccine weren't helped by it and in fact there's some question now uh, the immunologists are saying that there are some issues with getting the flu vaccine and actually possibly enhancing the the patient's negative response to the flu virus if they've previously been vaccinated with the flu vaccine there'd be a lot of people that would debate that and i'm not here to debate that okay. one way or another but i am not uh, on board with all the vaccine type stuff regarding the hpv vaccine i think Patients should be informed since it's something you have a choice over. I would point people to uh, some direction to look at uh, some of the studies that were done and down in Australia 
with the HPV vaccine and all the problems that were, uh, all the complications that happened as a result of that. And so to make your choice wisely, make your choice as an informed choice. Don't just reflexively say no and don't just reflexively say yes. Okay. Look into look into the issue before you ju before you jump. Yeah, that is a hard. Thing. Okay. Yeah. Hard decision to make. So, okay. Uh, so I had some general quality of life medical questions: how to get healthier, mm -hmm. how to you know lose weight. <clears throat> I'm not trying to you know. So I know my demographic. It's generally soccer moms and dads that follow my page. Um, also, I'll talk about hormone replacement therapy and get your you know from a doctor after age 30 and 40, what happens to uh, man's testosterone level and also the estrogen levels in women after those ages. So, so generally once a, and that, that's variable just like as the number of people here on the earth. I have seen men uh, in, their, in their 30s get compromised by the, the toxins and things that they're exposed to. For example, heavy metals. We know that a per, if a person has high levels of heavy metals, and oftentimes men have a lot of jobs where they're doing a lot of welding and things like that. When they get those heavy metals, those things tend to push down testosterone production in men. And so actually a toxin inhibiting their body's ability to replicate and make, uh, make their adequate hormone levels along the way. Same kind of things can happen with ladies too. Ladies get exposed to a lot of household chemicals and things like that and some of the jobs that they have. They have a lot of toxins that they're exposed to and those things indeed can interfere with their hormone levels. Yeah. When you combine that with the, the stress that we have in our society and, and our, it's no kidding, it's, it's much higher today than it was 20 years ago, which was higher than it was 20 years prior to that. We know the adrenal gland, which is the great comp uh, compensating gland along the way, we know that we are having more adrenal gland problems than ever before in our history. And the adrenal gland is, is meant to uh, uh, compensate for deficiencies in, in, let's say, estrogen or progesterone or testosterone to make some of the things that if the, t the testis or the ovaries tend to slow down, to make up the difference there. The adrenal gland also makes up the difference if the thyroid is running slow. Mm -hmm. You'll kick the adrenal gland up. So all that, what I'm trying to summarize and saying is that, that it's not uncommon at all for testosterone levels to fall okay. in men just because of what's going on in society and what, with our exposure and, and dealing with that, dealing with some of the toxicity things I think are necessary in order to get things boosted uh, along the way because there's an optimal level that these things should be running at. And if, and if our bodies are not, uh, don't have stable levels, uh, uh, there's no way that things can, can run and okay. heal as well as they need to. Yeah, I um, was hearing stories from soldiers coming back from war, Navy SEALs coming back from war, uh, from all that stress with the testosterone levels of 75-year-old women. Or that, that indeed, I've, I've seen it because I've seen my fair number of military personnel, and I can tell you that that's absolutely true. And they usually have adrenal glands that are really wiped out. And, and the adrenal gland issue is a, a big one. We used to uh, think of, uh, when, I, when I trained in residency, they looked at... Um, cortisol levels and, and if somebody had a cortisol level and they had a pulse, they basically were told they had normal adrenal gland function. We know now that there are some, uh, a variety of different levels of adrenal gland dysfunction and, and having that normalized makes all the difference in the world on how somebody coordinates uh, their hormones uh, within their own physiology. Yeah, I was, <clears throat> I've got guys, they talk about the stuff, hormones, and my, I guess, uh, 40, that's kind of a common thing. And I always tell, they, you know, say they can get this or that, or sometimes a family, some family doctors will just give you whatever, and uh, I always tell them, you know, you know, I don't know anything, just get a, get a blood test. And one of my pet peeves is a lot of people, they just give information without, you know, you know, without knowing it. They just think they know what they're talking about, they give information, or they sometimes even give medical advice. And I'm like, no, just... I know you need to get a blood test. You should go talk to a doctor. And like you told me, you got to check for cancer before you can do a PSA. It's like that. Right. So uh, the, before we ever, you know, first do no harm, mm -hmm. you know, that's what uh, the Hippocratic Oath is uh, partially about there. But, but before I'd ever want to give somebody testosterone because they had a low testosterone level, we'd want to make sure that they didn't have any type of, let's say, a prostate cancer along the way because we know that the testosterone itself will not cause prostate cancer, but it will cause it to grow faster. Mm -hmm. So if a person has a prostate cancer and a low testosterone, that's somewhat protective, but we need to look at that prostate cancer and, mm -hmm. and deal with that before we do anything to boost 
levels and actually accelerate the growth of the cancer itself. Yeah. I heard a story recently of someone didn't do the blood check like that you do and they, they died as a result of not getting the blood test. Before. That is that is a big thing. So you see a lot of advertisements on TV, all these attorneys uh, looking at, gee, did, did you or a loved one have a heart attack or a stroke as a result of doing testosterone therapy? Call this number and there's a class action lawsuit against some of these uh, companies. And the problem is, is that oftentimes there was no baseline lab work done in the first place, or no follow-up lab work done. Nothing's being monitored. And there can, if you're doing some medical therapy of some sort, there can be complications, and everybody's different, and so you can't expect that everybody to be the same. And so doing follow-up lab work to make sure that their body is functioning normally with the levels with if somebody's getting provided testosterone to make sure that the levels are within normal limits because they're if they're outside and uh, outside of norms you're going to create some problems so so i think that's the the key is it's it's not for everybody it can help a lot of people who are low as far as testosterone but it has to be done safely it has to be monitored and you have to be sure what you're doing and know your endpoints know where you're starting from know where you're going to and know when you've reached your target i think that's the the key point here I got a question. I was thinking about typing them out as you're talking. Um, do you know of any correlation with low testosterone and PTSD or maybe depression? Okay, so for men, mm -hmm. we know that testosterone levels, uh, when they are depleted, it changes our ability to think. It changes our brains. Just like in a lady, if we drop a lady's estrogen level or a progesterone level, it'll change their ability to think. Mm -hmm. uh, the brain and the endocrine system, there's quite a bit of overlap that's taking place there, and so it'll change, uh, change how it functions. So we know if you drop testosterone levels for a man, that he will be have a more melancholy type approach to life in itself. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have come across numerous cases over the years. In fact, when I was back in Colorado, there was a couple therapists that, that I co-treated patients with, and we kind of had a, uh, um, a pact uh, between the, the four of us that if a patient came in and was deficient as far as their hormones go, that I would have the, the therapist also advocate for them waiting to make any big decisions on big life decisions like on, on marriage. Uh, and divorce and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Making sure that the hormone levels are stable before you make those choices because if you've got a hormonal impact as far as on brain function and that's influencing your decisions and then you correct that hormonal deficiency along the way, that's gonna change how the brain thinks afterwards and there's no sense going through uh, uh, and completing something like a divorce if, if we can adjust things and help people function better just mm -hmm. by uh, balancing their physiology. Okay. Um, on that, uh, what are some symptoms of low testosterone or and low estrogen? So for so for men, one of the things that happens is they've got a decreased libido. They can have deficiencies in their ability to get an erection. Uh, for both men and for women, uh, low testosterone will affect women's libido too. Um, low testosterone will also uh, impair the body's ability to heal. Testosterone is the body's major anabolic hormone. And so if you're low in testosterone, wounds, injuries, uh, when you're training, your ability to bounce back from that training session is going to be less along the way. Okay. And so, so just deficiencies there alone will impact your uh, outcomes for your efforts to try and get healthy. And it, it may not even be your fault. It could be as a result of a low testosterone impacting you, the amount of exercise that you're doing and not being able to turn things around. Lower testosterone in, uh, decreases the amount of lean body mass. In other words, you wind up fattier as a male if your testosterone <coughs> levels drop. So, so it can have a tremendous impact just, just across the board. For ladies, it can affect uh, breast tissue, it affects their libido, it affects how they think, it affects uh, their emotions, it definitely can impact uh, depression and anxiety, the combination of estrogen, progesterone, specifically the ratio between the two. And ladies are a lot more complex than us guys are because they have got test testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, which all have to be balanced, which impact who they are. And so they are a lot more complex than, than you and I are by far. Okay. Do you, um, going back to the endocrine system, do you have any general advice, closing up that topic, going back to our other last couple of questions, um, do you have any general advice for a healthy endocrine system? Um, n number one, I think th this part's neglected a lot is, is that um, uh, just eating well. Eating well makes a huge difference. For example, uh, I, I give an example. If you don't 
consume adequate amounts of good fats along the way. Your body can't make, your adrenal gland can't make a, a, a precursor hormone known as DHEA. If your DHEA production is low, then your adrenal hormone production is also going to be low across the board. If you don't get adequate iodine in your, in your diet, your thyroid cannot produce adequate amount of thyroid hormone okay. along the way. And so diet, I think, is undersold as far as its impact on the endocrine system along the way. Too, okay. mu too many times people just jump right okay. to supplements and to uh, 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 prescriptions along the way. Um, Nadira asked, is it possible to measure levels of estrogen before taking tamo and after? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm sure they are safely low. Yeah. So tamoxifen is a medicine which is used especially in ladies of breast cancer because a lot of the breast cancer tumors are estrogen sensitive and so extra amounts of estrogen that are floating around actually cause the tumors to grow faster. So one of the things that oncologists use is tamoxifen to drop those estrogen levels. But it's curiously, most oncologists don't watch estrogen levels alone. They will administer the tamoxifen and nobody takes a look to see what the estrogen levels are. Absolutely, I think that's critical is to know where things are at. I can tell you of a patient right now who was placed on uh, a blocker uh, as far as her estrogen. She had a breast cancer, and they found out that the tumor had changed, and so they pulled her off the, uh, um, uh, the estrogen blocker, and, and then the other tumor started growing like crazy. And nobody ever looked at the estrogen. I said, well, what's your estrogen now? And she said, I don't know. So I said, okay, well, let's look. And sure enough, her estrogen from previously when she was on the estrogen blocker to that point in time had more than tripled, and it was in the high range, um, which to me would cause the tumor to grow faster, and that's what was taking place with her. And so we got right back on things. And there are some natural ways to block estrogen and turn it down too. So, but but that is a that is a big deal. Uh, and, and yes, you can monitor the levels, and I think that should be monitored. In fact, I do that all the time with people. I wish more uh, physicians also did that, and I take no credit for that. I had a couple of guys train me that made me pay attention to that uh, way back early, in my, early on in my training. Awesome. Okay, one last question. What could be done to help cancer patients? Well, uh, speaking of that last question, kind of tumors kind of went to this question. Yeah, yeah. So. So the number one thing that I would I would disagree with on oncologists on as far as cancer patients is you'll you'll hear oncologists say all the time diet doesn't make a difference, and I will I'm here to tell you just the exact opposite. The diet makes all the difference in the world. It doesn't matter what treatment direction that you choose. If you've got a poor diet, your outcome is going to be less than optimal by comparison, and so. Doing things like restricting carbohydrates and, and getting a better diet makes all the difference in the world because if we restrict the carbohydrates and keep the blood sugars more stable, the tumors, which are dominantly uh, responsive to sugar, which is why we do a, a sugar test with the tumors called a PET scan to go looking for the, mm -hmm. uh, the tumors along the way. If we keep the sugars restricted, we're also going to restrict the metabolism and interfere with the metabolism of the tumor. And so patients dropping, uh, dropping their carbohydrates out of their diet can make a huge impact as far as the cancer goes without doing any other therapies. Everything doesn't have to be a pill. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the thing is I, I'd really like to get across to people is there's so much that you can do just yourself, taking care of yourself and making smart choices along the way. Okay, we have a comment from Kitty. She says, I took tamo Tamoxin. Um, it made me very sick. My oncologist always checks. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad he does, Kitty, because uh, I think that's really important. There are there are things that somebody can take. Um, there there is uh, something called diendol methane. Diendol methane is an extract of broccoli, and we know that that can also help reduce uh, estrogen levels. And it's a natural agent, which is uh, uh, non-prescriptive and can be gotten by patients and can be very helpful in reducing estrogen levels. And it's a really easy thing to do. It's not an expensive thing to do, but I think it'd be really helpful, especially as somebody if they've got some marginal levels and they don't tolerate the medications. Awesome. Actually, now everybody's logging in. Like Lena King just came in. Now we've got a bunch of people joining sure. us as we're winding down. We've been going for an hour, so I don't want to keep you too long, doctor. Uh, I'm here as long as you guys want. Okay, I just you know want to wrap it up and say, hey guys, if you like this, um, we appreciate you guys joining us, and also we do do, do need. To
donations on the campaign trail. We are not financed by big money, by the PACs um, that, you know, generally, you know, do all the craziness and all that stuff. So if you guys want to help me out as a candidate, and if you guys want, of course, more of this type of thing that actually matters to you guys, um, even, a, you know, the max donation is $490. Um, even our five or ten dollar token donation is would be great. You go to that website right there uh, and uh, click the donate button. You know, even you know five bucks, ten bucks. You know, if you really want to be generous, that's awesome too. So I'll just put that up there for just a second. And if you guys think of any last minute questions, the next five ten minutes or five minutes for Dr. Thermos, he said he'll hang out and answer your questions and uh, help us out. So anyway. Um, I don't know what other kind of questions I got. I got a whole bunch for you. Okay. I got the, all of them that we wrote down. Um, this is our second time we've done this. Um, I said we did another one in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Appreciate it, doctor. Thank you so much. And I wonder what my blood work is going to look like after coffee and all this other stuff. Are... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got four, 48 days left of the campaign. We'll, we'll, we'll be looking at that, I promise you, to yes. get you back on track. Right again. after we win this election, I'm going to do blood work like November 7th. This uh, soy milk affects Absolutely. Soy, it, it may not affect specifically estrogen levels, but soy is very much an estrogenic type compound. And so soy will also activate the same receptors. There are some uh, products within the soy which will activate those same receptors as an estrogen itself. And so generally it's thought if somebody has um, an estrogen responsive tumor, that staying away from soy is a great choice <laughs> along the way so that they don't do anything to fast forward and help feed uh, feed the tumor and give the tumor more uh, uh, fuel uh, to move forward. Because the, those, uh, those hormones act as, as growth factors. They kind of amplify the amount of replication as far as the cells go when you expose the tumor to, the, uh, to those hormones if they are receptor positive along the way. So, Absolutely, it's any any woman with a, an endocrine type cancer, if you don't know um, what type of uh, uh, if you've got a uh, an estrogen uh, responsive type tumor, you're best to avoid the things like soy along the way until you define whether that, that is a, a problem for you or not. Uh, it's just that's a, that, so, that's an easy no brainer. Then she she asks, uh, so drinking soy milk every day is not a good idea? Question mark. Not a good idea. <laughs> not a good idea. Started all getting all on the soy kick. Well, soy was used a, a lot in the past because soy is a great agent. Really helps bring down cholesterol levels. Okay. The and and so a lot of people in this country way back in the in the nineties to drop cholesterol numbers down, people got on the soy kick and eating a lot of soy protein and such. The thing is for us guys, it can raise basically because it's an estrogenic type compound and, and, and basically be, can be considered amongst the total estrogens that are measured as far as like a, in a blood test along the way. We can see amplified levels so no, in guys. So no soy lattes at Starbucks. Would not be a good idea <laughs> for a male. I I've been drinking mine with coconut milk. No, I'll keep it that, that way. And, I, uh, and I, I like the idea of coconut milk, but so, soy for a male, especially any male who's dealing with any testosterone issues would be a no-no in my book. Awesome. Okay. Well, I don't want to, I, I, we're getting tired here. It's been like an hour straight. Um, again, this is more transparency for me. I am next time I want to talk about anti-aging. Okay. Something. We could do like a theme, like every two weeks we're doing this. So we got like 40, we got, hold on. We've got 47 days and 11 hours and 37 minutes to the, the polls open. So who's counting though? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and a lot of people in our office over there, Keller Kel Williams. And I think a lot of people are interested in anti-aging, how to stay youthful. Sure. And, um, and maybe we can do something like that next time. I'll sure, yeah, we can go. Some... We can go through the whole anti-aging thing: is what to expect, what to be looking for, what okay. factors uh, okay. affect everyone. Awesome. But I will put my plug in here right now for diet as being tops of the list. Yeah, and if you guys watching want us to cover a topic, let me know, and I will get with Dr. Thermos, and I will type up the questions, and I'll do an outline, and uh, you know, maybe you know, do more of this what you guys want to hear. Because I don't want to keep re re redoing the same questions over and over again that we always do. Maybe try something new and, and uh, you know, help you guys out. Again, instead of just saying thoughts and prayers, and that's, that's wonderful, we will send those. But, you know, we'll bring a doctor, you know. Can I just answer a question here for Cheryl? Uh, Cheryl asked a question about nut milks being okay. Uh, yeah, I think nut milks can be okay. That a lot depends on the patient. 
themselves, number one, if they have any type of nut allergy, needless to say, that wouldn't be a good idea. The other thing is to think about is nut milks. Nuts have a tendency to have large, high levels of what's called an amino acid called arginine in them. And one of the things we know about arginine is that um, <clears throat> can also enhance viral replication. So if somebody's got any type of chronic viral type issue that they're fighting, and that's a chronic health condition, and they're taking in lots of nuts, that's one of the things I'd take them, take them off of right off the bat. Uh -oh, so a nut milk would be that's a bad thing. We have, we have the almond milk at our house. Well, I, I think almond milk can be a good thing, okay. but I think a lot depends on the individual person along the way. And so if somebody has a chronic viral type thing, let's say a patient was HIV positive along the way, and they're fighting that, or hepatitis B positive, or hepatitis C positive. The last thing I'd want to be doing is doing anything to enhance viral replication along the way. And arginine has been known to enhance uh, the virus to uh, oh, replicate, to so that. we'd want to we'd want to head that off. And so nut milks and lots of nuts would probably not be a good idea in that person. So what's the best milk to use um, for cereals and whatnot? Personally, I, I think with, with what's out there right now, I think probably the, the tops in the list are probably the goat milks. Goat milk, okay. Yeah, yeah, and and almond can be good. Some of the almond milk isn't as pure as what you'd think along the way. I I personally got a patient which I know makes her own almond milk, oh. and and she does it. She soaks her own almonds and makes it up herself, and it is the best tasting stuff on the planet. And in that situation, somebody didn't have a viral type issue, I'd say that almond milk could probably be my number one choice. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. It's okay. been like an hour. I'd like to say we're all Great. getting tired, way over an hour. So I'm gonna throw this on here. One of the reasons why I do this, so you not only can you uh, see the website, but it's so I don't have a, a weird look on my face when it's saved in the news feed. Because <laughs> <laughs> when it stays in the news feed, you have like, and you have to go out and edit it later. So again, that's my background, 20 years US Army mil military police, captain, commander, anti-terrorism officer, and security advisor in the Pacific region. That's our key issues um, and our platform in Irvine. Again, safety, traffic, lower taxes, open honest communication with the public. You literally just saw my blood work, so pretty open and honest. Um, smart growth or slow growth, and a lot of people want no growth. Um, better relations, positive relationship with the schools for safety and reduce overcrowding. Reduce, um, start recruiting and retaining quality city employees. And again, also avoid centralization of power and keep decision making local in your hands. Again, there's my family. My wife is actually watching now. There's my first deployment. I'm not sure if Leonard was, Leonard was on that. I just saw Dan just joined us. He think he was on that deployment with me. So there's my family. And again, if you guys want to donate, um, every dollar helps. And our campaign, you know, donating a dollar to us is like donating 50 to somebody else. We're really, really smart with our money. And uh, some of the people that are watching now did donate. So I love you guys for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of you guys. And I hope I broadcasted enough with this so I can cut the feed. And, uh, you know, spare myself a, a weird look on my face in the news feed. <laughs> <laughs> Again, go to markforirvine.com, click the donate button. Even a 5 or $10 token donation will help pay for signs. Um, we did order our signs out, and the bill is coming very soon. So luckily our printer's on vacation, and she's awesome, and she's going to give us some time to pay. All right, guys. Um, catch us in, what, another two weeks? Yes. Yeah, uh, it'll be the third, the third Wednesday in October. Uh, so we're looking at um, we're looking at do this again. October 17th? October 17th. October 17th. Well, I'll make time from door knocking and walking my 10 to 20 miles every day. So you guys come chat with Dr. Thermos as we go through our journey on this, uh, this campaign to November 6th. And again, we're going to have a uh, campaign victory party looking at that uh, the Thursday or Friday after the election. We're looking at, what is it, November 8th or 9th. We're going to have that uh, victory party. We've got to go reserve the location now. And uh, anyway, you guys take care. Good luck, Mark.